I want to introduce very, very proudly and happily, um, I'm, I'm, and I'm glad to say I can't claim that we're close friends by any stretch of the imagination, but Dr. Uh, Pepe actually is one of my doctors. He's my, um, I don't know how else to say it, but he's my death doctor. He's going to be the guy who's there for me when my time comes. I have, uh, he has presented his background and information to the ladies group that I'm a member of from UU, Mies Hermanus. I attended a workshop that was organized by the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross Foundation last year, where there was a series of speakers all related to somehow um, thoughtful death. So I have, and, and he was so extremely helpful. When a very elderly friend of mine fell and cracked her noggin open on the sidewalk, and we really didn't know whether she was gonna make it or not. It was very serious, and she was 82 years old. And I called Dr. Pepe and he came right over and was very helpful. And the last time I talked to Denver Pepe, he said that he, you know, that Philly was doing really well and that you had checked in on her several times. She recovered amazingly enough and went on to have hip replacement surgery. But when I really needed Dr. Pepe in case of an emergency like that, he was there in five minutes. So I can't speak highly enough of his background and knowledge. He has over, I think you said over 40 years of experience in elder care. Is that right, Pepe? That, that's right, 42, yeah. 42 years, uh-huh. 42 years, oh good, okay. Pepe went to full screen and I'm in a little one. Okay, great. Um, and Pepe has written a book, which he's a little too shy and modest to talk about, but it's called My Old Age, A Menu I Must Choose. I have read it and it has got, it is the best source of information we're making decisions about your own. Do you, need to, do you need to move into assisted living? Do you need to move a loved one into assisted living? If it's not assisted living, if you want to take care of someone at home, what do you need to know in order to do that satisfactorily? It is really incredibly helpful. And it's in English, or I got a version in English. He's probably got it in Spanish as well. Dr. Pepe and I talked about how we could possibly disperse this book to people that wanted it, and we haven't been able to figure out how to do that. He's self-published, so you can't order it from Amazon. I know he's got a stock of them, um, and I'm just, I, if anybody's got any good ideas, please put it in the chat box, because I would love for you to be able to buy a copy of the book, because I found it extremely helpful and it's gonna stay by my side as a reference that I am sure I will use time and again. Um, I'm not sure, how much do you sell it for, Pepe? Uh, for the friends, 250 pesos. 250 pesos, uh -huh. and, yeah, and well well worth it at that. So, um, I, you know, I'll, I'll try to see if there's some, some way we could do that people, I mean, it's, we would trust you to pay for it, but then how do you get it? You got to come pick it up or it's got to be delivered. And um, we just, we hadn't figured out how to do that. Now, normally if things were normal, I would take the books to the UU Sunday service and you could get them there. But since we don't have that anymore, we'll just have to keep that pending. So keep it in mind. Um, and what uh, Pepe is going to talk to us about today, it's, it's going to be pretty wide ranging because we don't like, I don't like to keep the, fair, the focus too narrow, but the primary, um, the primary topic is going to be the importance of having what we call the conversation with your loved ones. Um, this is a topic which traditionally many people have been unwilling to talk about. I don't want to talk about my death. I, I don't know why people don't. It's a scary thought. My belief is that death is a part of life. And as we plan for the birth of our family or buying a house or getting married or make any of the other very important decisions that we all face, one of those most important ones is going to be, how do I wanna die? So having a conversation with your loved ones about what your expectations are, what you want, what you need, so that there is a lot of clarity around that can stop so much pain and suffering on the part of people who are left behind when we die. If we have made it really clear to them, this is what I want, this is how I want it handled, I'm gonna be comfortable with this, and we just have to do what it is they want, then that relieves a tremendous amount of um, 
trouble and concern. And, and as part of his presentation, I'm sure Pepe will give some examples of both good and bad instances, places where people were well informed and knew what to expect, and perhaps an example of what can go wrong when it doesn't, although I'm sure many of us have been through um, those ourselves. So Dr. Pepe, please um, share your wisdom and experience with us, and I will be keeping an eye on the chat box to see what you're typing in, so Pepe doesn't have to be distracted with that. And from time to time, I'll give him a flag and say, let's stop and take a look at what's in the chat box. All right? Okay, okay. let's go. Okay. Thank Pepe, you, Lily. It's all yours. Thank you, Lily. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you because uh, you're allowing me to share what I learned from my, from my teachers, my patients. I'm going to use the word patients, even when I don't like it. I call them allies or teachers. But I will, I will use the word patience just to keep the, just to keep the, you know, not, not, not uh, pretending not to distract you. Uh, I, uh, 1978, I decided on assisted living in Guadalajara because I needed an extra money, extra income. I'm a surgeon. I don't practice any surgeries in 1991. But when I started assisted living, I understood that I knew nothing about geriatrics. When my first uh, older one died in the assisted living, I was in a denial because I'm, a suppo I'm supposed to be a doctor to keep patients alive no matter what. And I had some, uh, I had some experience in ICUs in the General Hospital in Guadalajara, so I was angry with me. I was angry. I'm useless, I'm not a good doctor. I don't want to keep on this because then Finally, I understood that uh, all my patients die. From that year on, all my patients die. And it was hard for me to accept that because uh, you, ha you heard something about the Hi Hippocratic vow, uh, remember? You need to keep your patients alive, don't look. Um, so it was in some kind of um, shock. It took me about a year to uh, accept that that was the last place where my patients would, would be. Uh, I, I I was in, in an ICU in the Hospital Civil, General Hospital in Guadalajara, and I I was the best. I'm mocking on myself. I was the best because I was able to intubate, to take the uh, IV lines, and to use the medications to keep them alive, and to put the machines, the pumps, to keep their lungs working, and the medications keeping their hearts beating and I was the best. Oh, you can imagine where my ego was well, up, up, up there. Um, one day I decided to do something. I, I decided to practice an EEG electroencephalogram of, to each one of my patients. You know what it is? So it uh, uh, shows the brain activity the electrical brain activity of the patient. There was only 10 beds in the ICU and three of my patients had brain death. So at that moment, it was a conflict. What's next? What must I do to disconnect them, to keep them like this? Are they alive? Is this dignity? Is this quality of life? So I ran to see my, uh, the director, director of the hospital, and he told me, he told me, do whatever you do, whatever you want, excuse me, whatever you want. Whatever you decide is okay. But he spent perhaps 30 minutes in front of one of my death patients, and the pump, and their lungs working, and their heart beating, and so, uh, I had a lot of questions in my, I had a lot of, I'm a Mexican. I, uh, I was following the Catholic religion for many years. Now the religion I practice is love because it's a shorter place to this point to this point. 
So in a, when I was, was in front of my patient, I had a lot of, a lot of uh, conflicts thinking, what's the best for them? And the best is, uh, finally, some light came to my mind and said, they are, they are already dead. So if, if I disconnect them, only the lungs will stop or the heart will stop. Believe me, I had an electrical sensation all over my body and I did it, finally I did it. I felt a relief. I felt a relief, but uh, before that, um, I had this the electricity, as I always say, in all over my body. And when I look at my patient's face, so peaceful, so calm, I understood that that was the best, the best for, for my patient. Okay, that was on, um, I had a 28, 29 years old, so I was a baby. With the past of the years, I was very close to the older ones, to the facilities, to the assisted livings, teaching and learning as much as I could. Uh, soon I left behind the surgery part of my life, and I decided to spend 24 seven attending with the older ones and learning as much as possible to attend them the way they need because the science, medical science is wonderful. Okay, medicine is a passion for me. Surgery is a passion to keep them alive. It was a passion. But soon I, I understood that keeping them like that was affecting the quality of life and the quality of death as well. So slowly I understood many things I don't remember when the first came, the first book from Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, The Wheel of Life, came to my hands. And I said, hey, this is wonderful. This is me. Then I read something about Dr. Kevorkian. Remember, Dr. He already died as much as I understood. Yeah. I said, okay, what's the best for them? What's the best for them? And... I spent, perhaps I spent a week thinking, what would be the best for me? What do I think on my patients? What would be the best for me? Do I want to be in a night to you with a catheter, uh, with a tube inside my throat, with a lot of IV lines, with a lot of uh, B bleeps around me, uh, with these kind of doctors? Because I lived a lot of experiences in the ICU. Something like uh, the nurse coming with a totem face, I always say, a totem face with a syringe, and saying nothing, just pulling down the diaper of the patient and injecting them whatever, some medication. Nothing, how are you? Even when the patient is unconscious, they are listening. So I said, this is not human. So what's what I need to provide them, what I need? Something came up in my mind. I understood that the, we need four factors. One is the B and three H's. The B is vocation. And the other H's, is, one is humanism. The other one's humility and honesty. So I say, yeah. That's the way I'm going to, that's the way I will follow to, to provide them what they need. It was very uh, hard for me in many cases. Uh, I heard a lot of times, doctor, this is enough. God is that as bad as keeping me with this pain. Can you give me something? We all uh, had only the Merol. I don't remember this, the, the Merol. We were, we were unable to provide them uh, morphine. Many doctors, I'm talking about anesthesiologists and pain doctors, pain doctors, uh, they didn't use the morphine because they, say, they used to say, what about if we create addiction? My goodness, I said, they're about to die and this Stupid, let me say, a stupid doctor is just keeping to, just thinking on not to, to, to create addiction in the, in the patients. 
So it was hard for me to accept the use of morphine, the morphine to use uh, uh, strong painkillers and to keep them, uh, to keep them uh, alive. When uh, I mean, when, when they had activity, brain activity, uh, and with no pain, uh, I made a lot of crazy things. I understand. I say because I'm a, I don't know to say I'm an innovator. I'm a Quixote. I'm a, I don't know how to define myself, but I uh, used to stay with them, holding their hands and listening at them. So then I found that the best first medication for all of them is to listen at them, to listen, listen. Because there is a moment where they need to say, uh, I forgive you. If I'm, uh, if the, some, some relative is not close to them, I wanted to be part of that, uh, to recreate that, that function in front of them. So he spent hours with them. My, my shifts were 24 hours, but I used to spend 36, 40 hours with them because that was totally different. Uh, books and teachers, they say a lot of things. Don't get involved with your patient because you, will, you won't provide what they need. Now I say to my pupils, get involved with them because that's a part of the human relationship and you will provide exactly what they need because they need to be listened. They need a human, a human being close to them. They are not clinical cases. Always I say that and repeat it many times, much as possible, because, because they are not clinical cases. They are not numbers. Patients are human beings with a name and with a last name. And then the clinical part comes. The pain is not only the physical pain, but the emotional pain. Because uh, when some patient is close to death, a lot of things are happening inside of them. Did I write? Did I lie? Did I kill someone? Did I do what I was the best? And they, had a, they have a lot of questions. And as far as I knew, no one came with them. I'm gonna say something which I don't, well, it's part of my experiences. I used to call the nuns of the hospital, but they, these nuns only used to go with them and tell them, are you aware that you are a sinner and you need to be forgiven, otherwise you will spend the eternity in hell? And they said, no more nuns with my patients, go away with them. I want to stay with them. Okay, when I, when I started reading, books on death and dying. There's an, uh, I know that the, uh, Elizabeth Kubik was from the uh, number, uh, books, excuse me, the books. I understood that the role of the uh, doctor or a uh, professional, professional of health and close to, close to one of these uh, human beings who in this process is to provide them what they want, know what the science says, know what the doctors say. Instead of asking them, how are you? I used to uh, bring them a flower or asking them things like, hey, what's the best dish would you like to have in this moment? Um, in the wind, in that, uh, the wind, they used to call me the crazy Pepe, the crazy Dr. Valencia because of that but because I wanted to exert something which is essential, compassion, compassion. Well, that's part of my, my experience, but when, when my first patient told me, doctor, I don't want to live anymore. This is not quality of life. I was not using the morphine so far. At that point, I, I was not, I didn't have the guts to use them because of the influence of the hospital, because of the institution, because of the teachers, because of the, the high, the chiefs, the chief of the, the wing, don't use the morphine because you will create addiction. Okay, 
but the patient was with pain. I wanted to deal with the emotional pain, but what about the physical pain? So uh, I decided to buy morphine and to use them with, the, with my patients. In this particular patient, his name was Roberto, with uh, pancreatic cancer, metastasis all over his abdomen. He told me, do you think that if you stop my life, you're gonna make a sin? I couldn't answer that. I was 30 something. But that uh, question was in my mind. And I went to talk with a, with a priest. He told me, that's a big sin, that's a moral sin. If you do that, you will spend the rest of the eternity when you die, eternity in hell. Uh, that gave me, that led me to a solution, to a decision, excuse me, to a decision. I will, I will, I never will keep a patient alive, no matter what. I, I mean, with, uh, has in, uh, when they have these kind of uh, situations, uh, brain death or this excruciating pain, I will use the best painkiller and will keep them sleeping until the final moment. And then we allow the biology of their bodies to, to stop. Yeah, that was very hard for me to, to accept. But I found three, the three main obstacles to provide them what they need. One of them is religion. Religion, religion, each one of them. Some religions allow or give us more freedom to provide them what they need. The second one is the uh, pharmaceutical industry. You cannot imagine how many, how many industries come and say, I will give you 50,000 pesos each month if you prescribe my products. I will give you travels all around the world. And that's some kind of a uh, bribery or prostitution, which is the best word to define this. So I always say, no, I will follow my patient's desires. The other uh, obstacle is uh, habits. In Mexico, we have a lot of habits. One of them is my mother gave me the life. But you didn't decide your mother. Perhaps you decide your husband or your wife, but you didn't decide your father or your mother. But even though in Mexico, we uh, uh, Mother's Day, restaurants are full, full of people trying to uh, celebrate Mother's Day. Something similar happens, not at the same, uh, not the same, but it happens with the Father's Day. It's only because they're trying to give the mother in only one day, only in one meal, all the thank you that they, they, they want to say. But when I, uh, when, I, when I put a patient, a female patient, a mother in the hospital, in an ICU, all the families there outside waiting for an answer. And the question is, how's my mommy? How's my mom? When I, usually I listen to this to many doctors, she's a stable. What's stable? What's to be stable, up, here, or down? Is it about to be, to be released from the ICU or is unconscious or is about to die? So all those situations came, uh, uh, were making a, a, how do you say, a swirl in my mind. And uh, I thought when I read some of the, some of the articles written by Dr. Kevorkian, I said, okay, is that an option to, to provide them? What is the best to provide? From that moment on, I decided to ask each one of my patients what would be the best for me to give them. You cannot imagine how many things they, I heard. One of them wanted to have a cognac sip. 
Okay, can you Im imagine Dr. Pepe going with a sip of cognac inside of the ICU? Okay. Other one told me, I want my kitty with me. I took the kitty to the ICU, the hospital. Each one of them were looking at me and saying, what the hell is doing this crazy doctor? Other one told me, I want to go to Chapala Lake. I'm talking about Guadalajara, it's about 30 or 27 miles away from La Chapala Lake. So I took him there, she, it was a he, he drank two beers and some tacos, was happy. Died two days later with no pain, with no emotional pain and uh, talking about how, how wonderful were those uh, two beers and that experience with me. So uh, I had many, one of them told me all what I want in this moment, if I die one second later, it will be okay. All what I want from you is a kiss. What do you think I did? Yes, I kissed her. And she said, mm, nom, nom. <laughs> her mouth, her, uh, was, uh, she, she was breathing uh, with, it was awful with, uh, Okay, I don't want to. But well, I did it. She was happy. Yeah, she died perhaps at the week after. But she was saying every time I used to be in front of her, she say, "Hey." <laughs> so that's part of the human part that we need to live in that part of our lives. But we, we all are mortals. Being immortal provides us uh, the privilege of uh, to, to say. I love you, I'm sorry, I forgive you, and forgive me, when we consider models. Yes. Okay, Pepe, we have a couple of questions have come up around uh, euthanasia. Uh, what we've heard is that, is it possible, um, can a doctor disconnect life-saving measures on their own without the permission of the family or some designated individual. There's another question about whether youth, euthanasia is legal in Mexico. And then another re, uh, re question about if you have a recommendation for a doctor that does what you do in Ciudad de Guanajuato. Well, uh, it's not legal. No, it's not legal, but uh, I used to disconnect them and when I was in the ICU because of the quality of life that my patient was having. I never request any, and that I'm talking about when I was uh, no more than, not only than 30 years old, but I decided to do without uh, asking the family because they used to tell me, keep them alive no matter what, keep them alive. They were not alive. They were breathing because of the machines, and I decided to to do it by my, by, by myself. Uh, at the hospitals, you will find a lot of obstacles to do that. You need to do that hidden, in secret, because it's uh, it's illegal. If some another some other doctor uh, presents, uh, uh, how do you say? A demanda, one demanda, a demanda. Diana, ¿cómo se dice esto? Demanda. Okay. okay. Yeah, we may be in troubles. <clears throat> no, the, uh, you're talking about euthanasia. This, the, the question is a recommendation to, for a doctor who does, who does euthanasia in Guanajuato uh, City. I, I don't I don't know I don't really know. The, the other question was, uh, yeah, I am in San Miguel. Hospital, uh, no, the hospitals over uh, they don't overlook the medical directives. Someone wants to provide them in some cities of the, the Mexico. 
but they, they, they are not the best because they are following religion uh, principles. So uh, what I have in mind and is what I have in mind is that we are not religious men or people. We are believers. We believe in some, some, something or someone very, very, we consider God someone. That's what I want to say. I am a, getting a little bit confused to express myself what I want to say. But it, we have our own goals, our own beliefs. And uh, if we follow religions, we are committing a sin. And the rest of the family will say, that will be the worst. I always work with the families, always. I always talk with them, letting them know that it's not the best to keep their uh, loved one alive because of this and that and that and that. I practice with them and, uh, some exercises. Uh, I practice with them um, uh, some workshops to let them know what's the best for their, for their loved one. Finally, they decide to stop medications and to wait for the final moment coming with no artificial uh, feeding with no extra medications and with no no medicine but uh, sedatives and painkillers. I don't know if I'm answering your question. Am I? Yes, I think so. Okay. Okay. With the pass of the time, uh, I, I I decided to. I was invited for. Uh, I, I decided to start an assisted living here. It happened 13 years ago. So I decided to move and uh, we had different goals. So I decided to quit, but I, I started another part of my practice. What's what I'm gonna do here in San Miguel? I didn't want to uh, offer my services as a, as a physician. I wanted to be the medical director or director of that facility. So many things changed. But as soon as I understood that you have a different, a totally different uh, point of view regarding life and death, so I, I, I felt so relieved and I wanted to, to share with you, all of you, I'm talking about, I don't know if the best word to say is expats, but well, I will mention expats. I wanted to share with you these experiences. And I heard a lot of, uh, a lot of the uh, wishes like can you please doctor be with me in my final moment and decide what's the best for me at that time i read something perhaps you read some book i don't know if it's a book but it's a, or a, an article my five wishes my five wishes who's gonna make decision instead of me when i can't the other one is what kind of medicine i need i want to have in that moment other one is how comfortable I want to be? What do I want my, my relatives, my loved ones know about me? And finally, what do I, I want them to do with my body? And I said, what's a, something interesting issue? So I presented some lectures in the biblioteca, but I was, uh, uh, well, only a doctor who came from Guadalajara and I had perhaps a, a audience of no more than three or four patients, I mean, assistants. assistants. Uh, with the pass of the time, uh, many of you understood what is my position in, in front of life, in front of death, especially in front of death, especially in front of uh, the pain, and how keep them, how keep my patients with that, with love, with compassion, with no pain, it, uh, doing whatever they decide, not following the rest of the family, because I found that everyone makes decisions instead of the patient. Everyone makes make decisions instead of them. You know? uh, uh, I'm reading, I'm reading one of the, let, um, let, let me mention, if you would, um, Pepe, two 
aspects in particular. Mm -hmm. One is the importance and the best way to have the conversation with your loved ones, which would be mainly your family, about what you want to be done. Um, in cases of terminal illness, long-term disability, whatever, what, what conversation do you need to have with the people that will be impacted by that? And closely related is what has your experience been with advanced directives in Mexico. People okay. seem to have very widely um, varying experiences both in the United States and Mexico that sometimes advanced directives get followed and sometimes they get ignored. So question number one, how to go about having this very important conversation about what you want with your loved ones, the people who will be responsible for making decisions and do you need to have a Mexican advanced directive in place in order for a physician such as yourself in a situation, whether it be in hospital or at home, assist to make sure that there's no food, there's no what, whatever, blah, 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 blah. I don't know if that's called assisted death or not, but whatever it takes to let the person make their final transition. So the, the conversation and advanced directives. Thank you. I always work with the families. All the time I'm working with the family. When, when, some, when I'm called to see a dying patient, a close to death patient, I tell them, I want to talk with the family. Okay, I see the patient, I, uh, I, I see the records, I see all the, uh, the problems, medications, I see everything, and then I, I need to talk with the, with the family. And I make a, a meeting with them, and I, in that moment, I, I, I will try to find which will be the worst, the worst obstacle to allow the patient or the loved one to live, to die uh, the, in the most peaceful way. So uh, uh, that's part of uh, the thanatology, my function as a as thanatology. So I, I, I need to convince that one to convince them, and especially the obstacle, the one who is an obstacle, to uh, convince, convince that that's the, the best, their gift, the best situation that can, that can happen to their loved one is death, is dying. And I need to talk about God, hell, uh, purgatory, and all those things. I'm talking about the Mexican culture. But when I'm, when I'm talking with uh, uh, other cultures like American or Canadian or European cultures, everything's done, everything's easier. And I let them know, this is not what I want. This is what I listen from you, your patient, from lo your loved one. Uh, as I told you a while ago, I always come close to my patient. I ask them, making physical contact and making eye contact and i ask him what's the best for you in this moment what do you want me to do in this moment in the most of the times i say i want to stop this i want to die perhaps they'd say i want to live i want to relieve but the final word is i want to die and they're begging something like that Okay, at the beginning, it was very hard for me to listen to that and talk with the family and telling them, your father or your mother wants to die. Wants to die because of suffering. And okay, uh, I always tell them what the, what the patient says, what the patient wants. And I, I try to, let's say, it's like an, an analogy to cook a dish, properly for the rest of the family. Finally, they decide something like uh, uh, palliative sedation, which is one of the best uh, decisions, keeping the patient with no pain and sedated, sleeping, no food, no fluids, not IV. Perhaps IV, uh, in the IV, uh, I use the painkiller and the sedative, or by drops, some drops can be given 
can be uh, get the result. And then, uh -huh. you're talking about you having a conversation with the family. Yes. How important and how much do you encourage people to have that conversation before the status reaches that point? Not when someone is on their deathbed and their family is, you know, huddled around, but to have that conversation beforehand. So when that point comes, there's not a need for you to be there to tell the family, well, she wants to die. They know that already because uh -huh. they had that conversation. Yeah, well, I was talking about when it was someone's about to die, but the best is the uh, pardon, anticipated forgiveness. Forgiveness. Uh, uh, that's what I, I'm working some the workshops here in Mexico. Now um, everything's stopped, but uh, usually I uh, offer uh, perdón anticipado, anticipated forgiveness. When everyone is okay, I put them all together in one room and uh, the beginning because it takes a couple of days. That these workshops uh, takes a, uh, a couple of days. And I put them all in one room, and at the beginning, everything's happy, everyone is happy. And at the beginning, I'm asking them, what's the most uh, uh, virtue of your father? What, uh, what's, what you, uh, what's one of the best part of your father or your uh, grandparents? And uh, the same day at night or evening, I ask, what's the most hate part of, uh, how do you say, how can I say, what's what you hate the most in your father? What's the most uh, that you hate the most in your son? And everything happens all of a sudden. Everyone, everyone is uh, screaming, everyone to say, yes, father, you did this to me and blah, 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 blah. So, uh, I try to keep them moderating the reactions. I, I keep them calm uh, as much as possible and or making some kind of uh, uh, some uh, uh, pauses to uh, low the reactions, to low a little bit, to keep the lower a little bit. Then the last part of that is to, uh, uh, understand that we don't want to uh, hurt no one. We don't want to hurt. All what we do is like an instinct. So we think that we have uh, well, that we uh, uh, that we have the the right to say you are guilty to to be just yes, like a judges. We think that we are doing what's correct even when we're hurting, hurting someone. That's the moment when I ask him to be forgiven, to forgive me. And, but this happens with Mexican families. With, with the expats families, it's easy. Sometimes it's only about fun. We're talking, what's the best, what's the condition of my father? It would be better to, for him to die. Yes, that would be better. That would be the best for him. But I always try to keep them together before that happens with this, uh, with this uh, workshop, the anticipated forgiveness. And when this family forgive each one of the members, forgive each other, uh, when any kind of disease or even death comes, it comes totally different. So that's what I always say that keeping, uh, that forgiving my, our loved ones, we is the way of dying. I, I I don't I don't really know if I'm answering your questions. Yeah, I know that could, that's good. Sure, there is the other, question. The other, the other question um, that well, there are a couple that are coming up. One of them are uh, very specific to. Um, if I'm dying and in the hospital, if I have another doctor, can you help such and such and so and so? Um, I would suggest that if you want to know more about Dr. Pepe's services, that you get in touch with him directly. Um, we try to keep this on fairly neutral grounds in terms of making recommendations or suggestions. And I would prefer that Pepe not get into 
issues like that to keep the conversation on a broader topic, um, such as advanced directives. But I'm sure that if you have, would like to bring your more specific questions to him to see if you want to set up a personal relationship with on a doctor patient, uh, doctor patient basis, please get in touch with him and let him know about that. But I prefer that we not get into that in this workshop at this point in time, if that's okay. So, um, Pepe, tell us Thank what you, tell us what what your experience in Mexico with advanced directives has been. Uh, first of all, let me tell you thank you because some issues are not too not not too easy for me to talk like this. Uh, uh, so you're helping me with this. Okay, if somebody wants some uh, personal, if some one of you want me to answer some personal question, I'll, I'm open to that because it's a little bit difficult to me talking about something so as uh, it's a very tough issue. So thank you for that. So Mexico is, is not happening. So far it's not happening. Since now we are creating uh, some kind of uh, activities uh, among Mexican people, everything is changing. Now we have a couple of invitations to Mexico City, to Querétaro, to Guadalajara, Aguascalientes, and uh, Merida to talk about uh, Medica Directive. They want to, to put in a paper, one of the most important documents is the uh, um, living will. The living will is import, very important. That gives the uh, medical tutor the right to decide to, give, to bring the patient out, to release the patient out from the hospital or take him to the house and allow him to die at home, which is the best place. That's what I, uh, part of the medical directive is happening in Mexico but especially moving or uh, trying to push people to, or the deputies or the government to accept the, the living will as a part of uh, the rights we all have. But we are uh, just starting. In Mexico, it's not well, uh, it's not well spread this, this, this culture. And that's what I feel some kind of, uh, I envy you. I envy all of you because you have that in mind and you decide and you help and help us to, to give our patients what, uh, what they need. But we are uh, in pañales, we are in the apers so at this point. Yep. Okay, let's see. Um, someone has asked for your contact information in the chat room, there is um, the administrator has given, let's see, want more information. This is the Elizabeth Kubler Ross Foundation. Um, Pepe, is there a, uh, another, is that the best way for people to get in touch with you? Or is there another way to do that? Dr. Pepe's email is, okay, so um, Diana has given you Dr. Pepe's email in the chat box. So that's the best place to start if you want more information from him. How do we, do we need a helper at home or can we get medications at home? This uh, question came up a little bit earlier, um, Pepe, and it's about if one makes the decision that one wants to have power over, at, over one's time of death and way of death, is it possible for one to have medications in the home, um, be there barbiturates or any other combinations of things, so that one can Absolutely. make that decision and carry through on their own? Or it, number one, is it possible to have those medications in your home? And number two, would one need a helper or is it possible for one to do it on her own? Everything can be provided at home. Everything. I'm talking about IV lines. I'm talking about medications, nurses, uh, everything. Oxygen concentrators. Everything can be provided at home. But uh, talking about uh, uh, always must be su uh, supervised by a by a physician. Yes. To perhaps to decide with the family what is the proper money to make decisions. Please, in the uh, helping, especially 
especially helping the patient, but everything can be provided at home. Uh, hospice, one of the things that I have in mind uh, with the Elizabeth uh, EKR Foundation is to provide some kind of a hospice, hospice services at home all the time. I don't, I wouldn't like to use the word uh, hospice, perhaps, uh, uh, perhaps another word, but final or end of life at, uh, attention at home, hospital at home, or something like that. But what I want to emphasize is that everything can be provided at home. Uh, I, I don't like something, let me express this out loud. Uh, there are some groups of nurses or caregivers, and uh, they have like um, they're very expensive. They're very expensive. Some of them are only caregivers, and they say they say that they're uh, nurses. And that's uh, that's something I don't like. But even though, if some uh, doctor is behind them. Uh, the services provided to the patient will be the best. In my case, I, I'm always supervising. When I recommend, because I not always recommend a nurse, when I do that, I'm personally supervising that the patient is having what they need and uh, the quality of life he's having. And when I, something pops up or something comes up, I talk with the family. I may make another meeting, meeting to decide what's, to, what's the best for the patient to, to do. And I, I would like to offer as well, there is an organization called Exit International, E-X-I-T International. Um, if you Google it, they are very much on top of uh, home self -euth euthanasia. They have a book, a publication, which I think it's called The Purple Pill, I believe. It's either The Pink Pill or The Purple Pill. I can't remember which one. Um, but they have recipes in there and a full list of uh, substances that are legal or, or on, you know, legal if you get them prescribed or they're different combinations. I haven't bought a copy of it yet, um, but I want to because I'd like to, le to learn more about um, making that decision myself. I would want professionals involved in it, but I'd like to know, it would make me more comfortable to know that I do have at my wherewithal at home what I would need should I find myself in the situation that, you know, this is it, I'm ready to go, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna do it but I would suggest that you Google Exit International and take a look at what they have um, to offer because it's, uh, I assume it's in some ways kind of like the Hemlock Society. I haven't looked at the Hemlock Society in many years, um, but it is, was one of the first forerunners of people being able to make decisions about the time and, and uh, method of their death. But there's a lot of information about all of this on the internet that you can find by simply Googling, you know, assist to uh, dying or the Exit International or the Hemlock Society. Um, I know. There is another question here, Pepe. Um, what happens to people who cannot afford Dr. Pepe Valencia? I'm not really clear about what that means. Um, final exit, somebody's uh, written final exit is another, another. What, does, what happens to people who can't afford Pepe Valencia? I assume that's referring to people who become quite ill um, and perhaps go into what used to be um, the social services. And I don't know, do you have any idea what happens to people if they can't afford your help? Uh, uh, let me see, let me see, I understand. Afford, afford, you, you're talking about my fees or something like that? Yes, yes. Okay, uh, I don't live. I don't live. Uh, uh, I don't live for, from that. What I do, I, actually, I'm uh, I'm injecting stem cells. I'm providing to, uh, treatment of uh, regenerative medicine. So that's my main income. So if uh, it's not a matter of money, it's a matter of quality of death. It's a matter of humanism. It's a matter of love. Uh, okay, but sometimes I need to buy some medication, some, but well, I, I'm, I'm affordable, no matter what. It's not a matter, matter of money. It's a matter of love. 
I, I hope this answered your question. Yeah, there, there, a, a question came up about um, how to enforce an advanced directive in a hospital situation. And this is something that Wilka addressed in her presentation. And I think that she is right on with it. And it pretty much encompasses everything that I've learned and found about uh, advanced directives. What Wilka said is that you can do everything within your power to try to control what the situation is at your final transition. You can, I mean, there's a list of things that you can do. However, we can't control everything. So there is always the possibility that your advance directive might not get followed. And it could depend on the situation surrounding your final moments. If you were close to death in a car crash and an ambulance came and picked you up and rushed you to the hospital and they had to decide you know, whether to put you on, then they're probably gonna do that because that's what doctors are trained to do. If you are, um, uh, have a long more term lingering or even for example if it were something like a COVID situation where I understand there's like a two week window there when people generally can either be saved or not there may be time to say no I have an advanced directive and I want it to be followed you may set up a relationship with Dr. Pepe like I have um, to try to cover the instance that should I end up in hospital and that, you know, I'm not going to recover, I'm not going to get out of here, or I'm going to have no quality of life, then I have made it clear with both my primary care physician, all of my friends, Dr. Pepe, that no, I do not want to be kept alive. I am increasing the chances that my wishes will be followed, but there is no way to 100% guarantee that you won't end up in a situation somewhere where people have to make split decisions and they put you on life support and then they call the family and then all of a sudden somebody says, oh, well, she doesn't want to be kept alive. And then you're in that situation of, okay, well, what do we do now? So um, uh, Wilka's advice on that was just spot on, that you do everything you can and you know that we cannot control everything. And there are going to be circumstances where no matter what our wishes are, at some point, those decisions get turned over to a higher authority. And I don't mean God, I mean the medical system. And you know, you're gonna to have to depend on the people who you have let know your wishes to stand up for you and say, this is not what she wanted. We're taking her home, or this is not what she wanted. You know, we're gonna do, we're gonna handle it another way. So we do the best we can with the understanding that there are always going to be things beyond our control. Yeah, yeah, Let's see yeah, if we yeah. have any other questions here. Final exit is another one. Um, any more questions for Pepe or Pepe, do you have anything else you would like to add specifically for this group of mainly expats in San Miguel, De Allende, Mexico, many of uh, whom of us are of an a, a, age and stage in our lives when we know we really need to be thinking about this stuff. Yeah, go for the living will, but it's not enough. Living will is not enough. You gotta name a medical tutor. So he will make medical decisions because sometimes uh, a friend, friend cannot make uh, medical decisions with the, with the knowledge of your condition. Uh, it's okay, it's okay. But uh, something happened, um, I don't know, four years ago, something happened to me here. The hospital, it was, uh, well, okay. It was the hospital before the H, H plus. I don't, I don't know that name. I was called and I, I was told that one of my uh, patients, well, she was not my patient. She fell down. I was the medical tutor of this, 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 this uh, I don't know how to say patient, well, patient. And I was told and they told me that she fell down and she, she was taken to the hospital and uh, with, because she was unconscious. When I arrived to the hospital with a, with a paper, with a living will with me, uh, there were three doctors, three, three, three different specialties she was intubated and with an IV line, and she's about, she was about to decide if uh, 
uh, was necessary to, 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 to remove perhaps a hematoma inside of the heart. When I arrived, I told them, hey, I'm the medical tutor, I'm a decision is to take the patient to her house. If, what about if he dies? She wants to die at home, look at this. She, that gave me the power to took her, to, to release her, to took her out. One of the questions of two other doctors was, was who's gonna pay for this? And I said, well, I don't know because I didn't, I don't know, you make those made all decisions. So it's very important to have not only the living will, but a medical tutor, a medical who you talk already with and said, I don't want this, I don't want this, and I want you to make decisions instead of me. And I, I will put in my, with my height written in this document, that will be the best. There's something I wanted to advise you. Here's a question here about palliative care. I, I don't completely understand it, but is it true that palliative care became a law in Mexico in 2009. It was, uh, uh, it, was it happened in 2006. In 2006 and in, in Guanajuato, Guanajuato was the first state. Yeah, now uh, get it, only four, 14 states in Mexico uh, have this law, uh, how to say running or that this law exists, but uh, Querétaro, Querétaro is not one of them. Huh? Take that a look. Querétaro, uh, the, the palliative care, I mean, the living will is not accepted so, so far. So, this is for you, for you to know this. All right. Any other questions for Dr. Pepe before we sign off? I, I want to say something. Uh, it's uh, it's not an easy issue to talk about. I'm talking about it presentially, physically, but it's a little bit more difficult to talk uh, through this media, through the Zoom, because I have a lot of things in my mind. But my main goal is to provide the quality of life and the quality of death that my patient, finally, my loved one, decides. And uh, many things arise to my, when I'm talking, when I was on, I, I have been talking about many issues, but uh, many things are still here, uh, like uh, trying to arise uh, and express you, but it's a little bit difficult to, to do this through this media. I hope soon we will have the opportunity to talk personally. And if you want to talk with me personally, I'd be happy to do that. But it's a very difficult issue because uh, uh, someone asked me, how do you want me to call you? Dr. Pepe or Dr. Death? <laughs> so uh, I was smiling. I was smiling because, okay, because you know, you perfectly know what's my point of view and that I practiced in some occasions. I helped some patients to die, some human beings, because as I told you, they are human beings with very special needs and death, dying is one of their special needs and they need some very special doctor with special skills and with special philosophy in front of them to uh, help them to follow what they want. So it's a little, little bit difficult to express uh, my deep, my most inner feelings through this media. I hope you understand this. <laughs> Okay, let's see, what do we have left here? Um, is it true elsewhere in Mexico, my living will will be honored, must I carry it with me? I don't, it, it's not gonna vary from place to place, um, owner's iPad, it's gonna depend on the situation. 
some of the laws, some of these laws are statewide. Um, many of them are statewide. We're going to have a discussion later on about when someone dies, how long can you keep the body and what can you do with it? And those, um, those are state by state. But whether a living will will be honored is going to depend on the situation and where you are. I don't think we can make a, it, it doesn't hurt to carry it with you if you want to, but that doesn't, I've heard situations where people had the medical directives and showed it to the doctors and the doctors just said, well, you know, our job is to keep this person alive and, you know, haven't paid attention to it. So I, I, there's not going to be a direct straight answer to that. Um, what makes a living will valid? In Mexico, um, I'll just go over this quickly. I'm sure Dr. Pepe could. If you want a living will to be valid in Mexico, it's got to be um, drawn, up at, drawn up by a notario and submitted to the state of Guanajuato. Um, an abrogado, an attorney, can draw it up for you, but it will have to be, uh, it will have to go through the hands of a notario to be registered in the uh, government in Guanajuato to be a legal, you know, a totally legal document. Yeah. Um, clarification, there is a law of palliative care, thank you Wilka, although there is question about what exactly is allowed and under what circumstances. The law for land subjection is only active in 14 states, Correcto is not one of them. So, you know, we're, com we're, we're I'm working on this from Guanajuato and the last speaker, Wendy, was from Jalisco and we started getting a little bit more information about how these laws vary from state to state, but I haven't ever looked at anything but um, Guanajuato, so that's that's the best I can tell you about that. Um, let's see, we're getting down to the end of our time here, so if you do have any ad additional questions, please post them for Dr. Pepe. And in the meantime, um, once again, I'd like to urge you to make your donation for the workshop series and remind you that the next workshop will be next Wednesday at 10 o'clock. It will be at this same Zoom address, um, but Diana will send out a, a reminder. And um, I'm, I'm working on a list of links that I think will be helpful. There'll be links that'll be related to things like Exit <clears throat> International. There's another group called The Conversation, which was developed specifically around having a conversation about how you want your final transition to be handled. If any of you are aware of other sites that may have useful information for us, big truck passing, um, share that and we'll put them out to the group because um, the more we know, the better we can make decisions. So next week, our speaker is going to be Felicitas from Sacred Wellness Grove in Buffalo, New York. She was uh, recommended to me by Wilka Roy because Wilka has done work with Felicitas in the past. And um, Felicitas is a coach and a yoga instructor and a mindfulness coach and she's involved in all kinds of really interesting things. Um, what she is going to talk about is how a mindfulness or a contemplative practice can help to prepare for a thoughtful death. She is going to send out an email package to everybody on this list that has got some suggested exercises or practices that you can use to develop a mindfulness or contemplative practice, contemplative practice. Um, let's see, what else? And we will do some during her workshop she will guide us through a few, not a lot, it's not gonna be an online yoga class or anything like that, but she will guide us through a few mindful practices that will help us become centered in ourselves because that's always, I think, the basis for, for preparing for a thoughtful death is number one, yeah, you got the paperwork, you got to get an order and you got to get 24 hour association and you got to get an advanced directive and you got to have the conversation with your family and loved ones. Um, but there also is going to be a tremendous amount of inner peace when it comes to addressing our final transition. We look back at our lives and think about what we might 
like in the next life or what has been important to us or what, what we wish that we had done or had done differently. I think that that is going to be a huge element of preparing for a thoughtful death is us sitting with ourselves and taking stock and thinking and making peace with ourselves and acknowledging the things that we've done that we're proud of. Uh, as uh, Wilka mentioned, our um, community legacies, the things that we've done that have made a difference in other people's lives, how we've helped, and be really, really conscious around, okay, so my time is coming. Am I ready to go? Am I looking forward to it? And whatever comes next, who knows what comes next? But if we are peaceful within ourselves, that is going to make a tremendous difference in how we approach a thoughtful death. So I look forward to seeing you all next Wednesday morning at 10 o'clock at this same time and place. And um, Pepe, if you'd like to say anything by way of goodbye to everybody, here's your last chance. Thank you. Thank you. You mentioned something which is very important. Uh, we, uh, we, I mean, Elizabeth Kuehler Rose, Mexico Central, we will create something like uh, to help all of us to understand that the most important part of our life is death. We're working on that because even though, even when we accept that we will die, we need to uh, lost the fear because we have a lot of questions. No matter the religion, the religion we have, we have a lot of questions. What's going to happen then after I die? Okay, we must put attention on the moment of dying, but what about them? So through many, uh, perhaps, uh, lectures, some uh, uh, workshops, we want to offer you a different uh, way to see this and to help you to process, process this before, before the moment comes. And well, I want to thank you all. Uh, Please understand that uh, it's a little bit difficult to express well, well, what I have inside, but I'm open to, to answer all your questions personally if you want and understand how hard it is to accept publicly. I mean, understand what I mean? This, this kind of issues because uh, no, I don't know any other doctor who thinks the way I do. And if they think the way I do, they don't accept publicly. They don't talk about this. Yeah. So, but I'm here and thank you. Thank you all, all of you to, for your attention.